If Jane Jacobs were around today and she had a bike, where might she take a ride? Hi, I'm Robin Rothstein, longtime downtown Manhattan resident and arts chair for Community Board 2. Welcome to this third and final video in my bike tour series. In my first video, I showed you public art, landmarks, and monuments in the West Village. In the second video, I moved over to Greenwich Village, and in this last video, I moved further east into NoHo, the East Village, and Alphabet City. I have a lot of cool stuff to show you, so without further ado, let's roll. First stop is right up the road from the Houston Bowery Wall where I ended the previous video. We're heading north up Lafayette to Astor Place, home of the iconic Cube, and as I came to learn a whole lot more. I caught up with Village Alliance Executive Director William Kelly, who gave me a view into this vibrant open space and its fascinating history. What is the Cube? What is the Alamo? Why, are the, why the two names? That's funny. Well, you know, it's it probably is the most uh, apparent or obvious symbol of Astor Place. Uh, it is a piece of sculpture by Tony Rosenthal that was initially installed in 1967 as part of the city's uh, Department of Cultural Affairs Sculpture for the Environment installation. And it is named Alamo, that is the name of the piece by Tony Rosenthal. Um, colloquially, it is called the Cube. It rotates some days better than others. Astor Place itself is kind of an interesting street slash place, you know, whatever you want to call it. Originally, originally, I think many people know that Broadway itself was a Native American trail that ran kind of a high point north-south along Manhattan, uh, the island of Manhattan. And what is now Astor Place uh, is an east-west branch off of that, that the Native Americans took to some fishing ground, uh, fishing areas along the East River and marshes and that sort of thing. I'd say, I guess probably in the 1600s became the way to go to Peter Stuyvesant's farm, which is now Stuyvesant, where Stuyvesant Town is. John Jacob Astor, he owned a lot of this land and that's why the area is actually called Astor Place. There is a subway station there that's one of the original IRT stations, from, dates from 1904, has uh, mosaic work inside, including beavers, which is the sign of John Jacob Astor, but I believe he made his fortune uh, as a, a furrier. The mosaic trail is, uh, I guess, guerrilla art. It was not originally commissioned. Uh, probably 30, 35 years ago, a man by the name of Jim Power uh, decided to create a trail from Broadway and 8th Street east to Tompkins Square Park in and around the village. And now, fortunately, they'll be part of the history and the city's fabric forever. Um, and the Green Market is one of a number of ways that we program the space. Uh, this uh, market is the first of this type that we do, but it is also meant to be open and free uh, as a service to the public in the local neighborhood. So that's, it's been, uh, you know, it's a slow time this year, but I think the farmers are pretty happy and they'll definitely be coming back next year. And maybe this is true of, of many public spaces, but when you get to a public space like Astor Place, it, it asks you to pause, think, look around, look at your surroundings, and there is usually something going on that, that might pull your interest. And so I'd say it may not be a Central Park, iconic as Central Park, but it is essential to uh, the fabric of the neighborhood uh, and to the way that we experience cities uh, to have spaces like Astor Place uh, and for them to uh, welcome everyone. Next stop, St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, an Episcopal church on East 10th Street with roots dating back over 350 years. I caught up with Reverend Ann Sawyer where I learned a bit about the church's rich history, notable figures, and its deep connections and commitment to New York City's downtown art scene. So my name is Ann Sawyer. I'm the 14th rector of St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. The church itself dates back to 1799 when the cornerstone was laid 
but it goes back even further than that. It goes back to 1660 when it was um, originally the, the site of the first chapel of Peter Stuyvesant. It has been an Episcopal church since 1799. In terms of architecture, over the course of many years, they've added the church steeple, the bells, um, they've ordered a wrought iron fence along with a cast iron portico. In front of the church there are also two beautiful sculptures um, by Solomborum. Uh, they're Native Americans and they were um, uh, first carved in the early 20th century, the early 1900s. They were actually Solomborum's last major works of art and the names of them are Inspiration and Aspiration. So we have three permanent art art groups on site, Dance Space, The Poetry Project, and the New York Theater Ballet. In addition to um, the rectory is actually home to two historic preservation organizations, leading um, preservationists in the city, the Village Preservation and the Historic Districts Council. The first and foremost um, uh, family that is buried here is the Stuyvesant family. So their family vault is actually on the site of their original chapel here buried underneath the church. And then one of the stories that I, I um, also really uh, love to tell is of the Nicholas Fish family. As a, a general in the Revolutionary War, and he was best friends with Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and apparently, um, I understand, was asked um, or would have stood with Alexander Hamilton during the duel. But Alexander told him to stay home, that, that it was uh, deadly for him to be there. As you learn about the history of St. Mark's, you're really learning about the history of the United States. Um, its founding shortly after the Revolutionary War, the um, establishment and the growth of the Episcopal Church, it's all kind of woven together during that period of time. There's that chapter of it, but then there are the arts chapters, and, and which again continue to live into this day. The poets and, and the dancers who are, are drawn here from all over the U.S. and all over the world to come to St. Mark's to both not only to perform but to be present in this sacred and holy place. And the historic preservationists who are doing such important work throughout the entire city and all five boroughs to preserve this living history of New York. The, the congregation, as, as an Episcopal priest, I have to make a pitch that, you know, we've always been a kind of a, a progressive um, even sometimes radical congregation that is committed to social justice, committed to anti-racism, a lovely group of people who come together, um, many of whom have lived in the East Village for decades. Whether you join us on Sunday for worship, uh, which we've begun to, to do, or you visit during the week through one of our arts organizations, or you connect with our historic preservationists, we do hope that you will come to St. Mark's. Um, and, and then come back again and again. Our third stop on this tour brings us into Alphabet City to visit the Bird's House, as in Charlie Bird Parker's house, where I got a special invite to come inside. Enjoy this quick peek in the Bebop Master's former apartment and rear garden while we learn a bit about the legend from a bird expert. My name is Jason Marshall. I'm a professional saxophone player. I'm from Washington, D.C. Uh, I have lived in New York just a little more than 17 years now. Um, I, you know, music is my sworn vocation, uh, and uh, Charlie Parker is one of the foundational elements to the, the craft that I practice, to the industry that I'm in, um, and to the work that I'm doing. Charlie Parker is so important because he was born uh, and developed at a time when the, the Black American society was in a transition and he really bridged the gap between what we would call swing music or jump blues, uh, creating a new style that he didn't really call bebop, but became known as bebop. Charlie Parker was one of the, the figures that was used to teach us as young musicians growing up in, in and around Washington, D.C. that if, if you accept this this calling towards music, you know, as they, as they might say, the, the sworn vocation, understand that some part of your life will include a period uh, quite, quite uh, similar to being at a monastery where all you'll do is eat, sleep, and practice. 
and uh, Charlie Parker went through that phase and coming out of that, not that he wasn't a musician before, but become, coming out of that phase, uh, he, he certainly began to be recognized as what we now know as Bird. His, his uh, stature is why people came to New York City. You know, the music that he made that sort of became uh, what we might now call viral, the thing that everyone was doing, he, he and Dizzy Gillespie and, and, and really Bud Powell uh, and Thelonious Monk, they, the thing that they did are why New York became the jazz sort of center of the world. You know, Ch Charlie Parker was a, a really high level thinker. And I, I, I think that if, if there was anything that I want to really drive home is that black American art was nothing if not a collection of really high level thinkers uh, having to operate under duress. The way Charlie Parker was explained to me, they said, well, if, if you were ever around Bird and he didn't have a saxophone, to hear him talk, you'd never know he was a musician because they were talking about all, they were talking about Einstein, they were talking about the veracity of the theory of relativity. They could really talk about anything. So that, that for me, that, that as a young, I mean, I was a, I was a teenager when I heard that. So I could, that let me know that no matter how deep I wanted to get into the music, that I owed it to myself and to my community to become a well-rounded individual. Charlie Parker was a, was an improviser without fear for most of his life. And just the, the reflexes to improvise on that level necessarily informs everything I do. And uh, it, it really reminds me that no matter how difficult the circumstances are, greatness is still possible. And last but not least, no trip to Alphabet City is complete without a visit to iconic Tompkins Square Park, located conveniently right across the street from the Charlie Parker residence. There's a vibe in this space like no other public park in New York City, with plenty to observe and absorb, including the Temperance Fountain. According to the New York City Parks website, the Temperance Fountain dates to 1888 and was the gift of wealthy San Francisco dentist, businessman, and temperance crusader Henry D. Cogswell. The fountain was a result of Cogswell's affiliation with the Moderation Society, which was formed in the mid-1870s to address health conditions on the Lower East Side and to provide free fountains to encourage citizens to drink water instead of alcoholic beverages. Yeah, good luck with that. And make sure to check out the unique assortment of paving stones in the ground by the fountain. These are part of the East Village Park Conservancy's Make Your Mark in the Park program that launched in 2005. You'll see a wide variety of messages, quotations, and tributes. There's a lot to take in at Tompkins Square Park, so make sure to meander a bit and enjoy the unique energy that's attracted activists, artists, longtime locals, and curious visitors alike for decades. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed Robin's Ride and that you'll consider checking out the first two videos in this series, as well as all the public art, landmarks, and monuments when you're ready to hop on your trusty set of wheels. Until the next time, happy riding.